reliability and validity. What does it mean when someone tells you that you're reliable? Maybe you're a person who sees things through to the end. Maybe you're always there to support or commiserate with others. What about when someone tells you that your feelings or rants are valid? Or when others validate your opinions or successes? Maybe it means that whatever you're experiencing is real and duly acknowledges to be existing. To be known is to be loved after all. It reflects something that happened and not just a figment of your imagination. Reliability and validity in psychological research mean something similar as it is used when you talk about a reliable person or a validated experience. Of course, there are also many types of reliability and validity depending on whether you're looking at them quantitatively or qualitatively. So, for this lesson, we're going to see first how reliability and validity are defined in these two traditions. Then, we're focusing on how the terms are used in psychometrics, the field that studies how we make measures of psychological characteristics like personality and intelligence. We focus on this field for a bit because most research articles use these terms in the context of psychological measures. Finally, we'll discover how we can evaluate and ensure reliability and validity in general regardless of which tradition our studies follow. Reliability and validity can mean different things in quantitative and qualitative research. From our example on reliable people and validated experiences, we can say that reliability has something to do with being steadfast, and changing, it will do the job well each time. Meanwhile, validity is close to truth-likeness of reflecting things as they really are in the world. Given this, quantitative reliability is specifically concerned about the stability and consistency of a particular measure or procedure. That is, it should have the same effect or outcome on a person across repeated testing and across similar conditions. For example, a reliable measure of academic motivation must consistently indicate that a driven and studious college student is motivated to study relative to another student who lives by today and lets things come as they do. However, in a post-positivist lens, our measures can never be perfectly reliable because of uncontrollable errors, which lead to cases where our measure or procedure show dissimilar and unusual results. So, our motivated student can end up unmotivated based on our measure because of environmental variables, maybe they have twice as much work that day, personal changes like boredom or in this case fatigue, and observer errors. The researcher measuring our student's motivation went out for a coffee and missed the 15 minutes when the student magically finished a two-page essay. Next, quantitative validity tells us the extent to which our measurement or procedure indeed reflects what it's supposed to do. An intervention intended to increase academic motivation should target things such as a student's attitudes toward learning and not unrelated stuff like happiness in life. A measure of motivation must look at things like satisfaction in the learning process, not irrelevant domains like academic competitiveness. Quantitative reliability and validity are related to each other. A typical analogy is a dartboard's bullseye serving as the thing you want to measure, and the darts are your attempts at measurement. A reliable dart hits the dartboard the same place, a valid dart hits the bullseye. Reliable but invalid measures land on some construct repetitively, but we don't know what construct it's hitting. We don't know what we're actually measuring. A measure can't be unreliable but valid, because if you throw all your darts on the board and one hits the center, you still have more darts all over the place. You have many scores, but you don't know which one is anywhere close to what you want to measure. So, it just looks like the measure is completely unreliable and invalid. The best case is when the darts land close to each other and very near to the center. Again, in post-positivist realism, we're going to hit the wrong things, but repeated attempts make us land close enough to what we want. So, reliability is a necessary but insufficient condition for validity. Your measure might give these scores close to each other, but you're not sure if they're close to what psychological domain they're supposed to reflect. Remember, the constructs or concepts we study quantitatively in psychology tend to be abstract, so we have to define it in some concrete or specific way that makes the construct possible to measure. We call this process operationalization. The abstract concept love is easy to feel but difficult to measure, so we can define it as increase in heart rate following exposure to images of the significant other, or demonstration of positive sentiments and commitment behaviors with respect to the loved person. 
and these are easier to record on a heart rate monitor or self-report scale. Reliability is then how consistent scores are when we use this same definition, and validity is how well this definition captures the phenomenon in the first place. The qualitative versions are more difficult because, as you'd remember, there are many paradigms within this tradition. We're going to look at the most common definitions, but be aware that they may not apply to all qualitative work. Often, qualitative reliability is also viewed as consistency, this time in terms of the interpretations and analyses of multiple people looking at the same narrative data. This is called intercoder reliability. People trained in using the same clear and comprehensive coding scheme or a system of translating participant responses into common themes should categorize answers the same way. Still, other qualitative researchers don't think that reliability is needed in their work because the entire point is to show the diversity of perspectives. Inconsistencies can appear between and even within people, and that's okay. It is this complexity and chaos that reveals the death and breath of human experience. Regardless, validity is of great importance in qualitative work. Our interpretations, findings, and insights are valid when they reflect social realities as participants view it or credibly represent their experiences. So, when we make conclusions, we don't put words into our participants' mouths, and we make inferences only as far as what their narratives provide support for. We have numerical means to measure how reliable and valid our quantitative scales and measures are. When you read any quantitative work that uses some form of psychological measurement, they'll usually report the psychometric properties or reliability and validity information of their measures. To demonstrate this, we're going to look at William Swan Jr. and Peter Renfro's 2007 study development of the Brief Loquaciousness and Interpersonal Responsiveness Test, or BLIRT, which measures blurtaciousness. But another way, pagkamema, may masabi lang. The reliability of measures is often reported using three indices. The first one, test V test reliability, tells us how consistent or stable a person's scores are across multiple instances of using a measure. For example, Swan and Renfro scale is quite good on this index because it shows that respondents who are blurtaceous are still indicated by the test as being blurty three months later. They reported a Pearson's R correlation coefficient of 0 0.77, higher values closer to 1 meaning that their scores before and after three months are quite similar and still related to each other. Values closer to negative 1 indicate that the scores diverge or that people become less blurty over time. 0 means no relation. It makes sense because talkativeness is assumed to be a part of who you are and your personality doesn't tend to change. So, if a personality measure tells you that you switch your personality often, that's likely to be a bad measure. However, measures of things like opinions and preferences are less stable across longer durations because it's reasonable to think that your likes and dislikes would frequently change as you acquire new tastes or information. The next index is inter-rater reliability, which shows us how much observers agree on the scores they give when observing a person's behavior or an event. This is much like intercoder reliability, only that the consistency is measured by score similarity and not by thematic closeness. So, if you get three people to watch a video of a very talkative person, the blurt scale would be high on inter-rater reliability if they all scored the person as being blurtaceous. Again, like intercoder reliability, Inter-rater reliability is increased when observers are given training on what specific behaviors to observe and how to use the measure properly. Finally, internal consistency looks at the reliability of the items in the measure. That is, do these individual items measure the same thing? In psychology, we often measure the same concept or behavior using multiple items with different wordings to tie and capture the phenomenon from multiple angles. If you use just one item, you could end up with a measure that's too specific, short-sighted, and unable to capture the complexity of the behavior you're targeting. Swan and Renfro's scale has eight items which all have something to do with speaking your mind. For example, if I have something to say, I don't hesitate to say it. So, if we propose to include, I want to get my ideas out as I think of them, this item might be internally consistent, but thinking before talking is a good thing, might not because it's opposite of what the scale aims to measure. When items are related to each other and they measure the same thing, 
the scale would get a high rating on an internal consistency index. One of the most common is Convax Alpha, which won and went for reported for their scale at 0.84. Values above 0.6 and closer to 0.1 mean higher internal consistency. A word of warning though. The threshold changes depending on the purpose of the scale, with tests intended for clinical diagnosis required to have higher reliabilities than those suited for research. At the same time, if you have an almost one value, it might mean that the items are redundant, measuring just one ad spec, and so a very high rating is not always good. If we have a reliable measure, we then ask if it's valid. We have three general groups of validity indices. The first group concerns subjective validity, or how much you think the measure is doing its intended job. Phase validity tells us if our operationalization of the concept we're measuring is possible. So, a phase valid scale about flirtatiousness should look like a measure about it, and not some other concept like happiness. Meanwhile, content validity tells us if our items capture the many facets of the behavior we're measuring, based on our theory of what the behavior looks like. So. A good scale of flirtatiousness, a behavior marked by being pleased at sharing one's thoughts quickly in a social setting, should contain items about talkativeness and not being able to shut up when inspiration types. The next two groups of validity are measurable. Concept validity allows us to see if our own measure is able to approximate the concept we're targeting when using our current set of definitions or operationalizations. That sounds like a lot, so let's see what Swan and Renfro did. Based on their theorizing and literature review, they defined or operationalized flirtatiousness as how quickly, frequently, and effusively people respond to their partners. So, based on convergent concept validity, the blurt measure should correlate or have some relation to skills that measure similar things, such as extroversion or desire for social relationships and engagement in social behavior. Meanwhile, it should have discriminant concept validity or no correlation with seemingly close yet actually irrelevant concept. So, blurty people like to talk, but this doesn't have anything to do with attention-seeking or the desire to be liked by others. Indeed, the blurt scale correlated with measures of similar concepts and had no relation with the dissimilar. The final group is about criterion validity, or the relationship of our scale to actual behaviors. To review, concept means related to other measures, criterion to observable actions. Predictive validity means that a measure is able to tell what a person will do in the future. A person we measured as blurty today should be quite talkative in a future occasion. Meanwhile, concurrent validity shows that the scale can measure a behavior at present. These two are more prominent in academic and organizational contexts. For instance, your college admission test scores are used to predict how well you'll perform in your first few semesters in the university. Meanwhile, Auditions, authentic assessments, and job performance tasks allow evaluators to see your skills in the here and now by making you demonstrate your abilities. The third criterion validity, known groups, is what Swan and Renfro use. A good measure should discriminate between groups of people believed to be different on the dimension measured by the scale. In their study, they compared librarians and salespersons and did find that people in sales have higher build scores. Makes sense. A withdrawn and quiet salesperson doesn't really make many sales, and you're not supposed to talk a lot in libraries, so there you go. As we've seen, there are many types of reliability and validity in quantitative studies. Researchers often report one or two for each type depending on what purposes their scale serves. So, when scores are used in the aggregate, we're good with above middle thresholds in a few indices. But when measures are used to make decisions concerning individual therapy, education, or work outcomes, we want to be really sure about our decisions, so we test our measure out and provide support for its psychometric strength on more fronts. We use a lot of strategies to ensure that the findings of qualitative studies are valid. Validity in qualitative studies are not measured because qualitative, yes? Instead, John Cresswell and Dana Miller give us a few strategies to improve the validity of our research process and interpretations when doing qualitative work. But first, a few notes. Their nine strategies combine who is responsible for a strategy and from what paradigm that person works. So, a strategy can be the primary responsibility of the researcher, the participants involved in the study, 
are other people such as reviewers and stakeholders who are not directly involved in the research. Similarly, the strategy can be post-positivist, focused on accuracy, constructivist, representing the participants' perspectives authentically, or critical transformative, being aware about issues of power and representation in research. So, researchers triangulate their findings by using multiple methods to arrive at a more complete understanding of a phenomenon, look for disconfirming evidence to capture the complexity and contradictions of participant perspectives, and practice reflexivity by acknowledging how their assumptions, beliefs, and biases can color how they interpret and report research findings. At the same time, researchers invite participants to be more actively engaged in the research process. They validate whether the insights and conclusions the researchers derive reflect their experiences through member checking. Researchers prolong their engagement in the field to develop more trustworthy and deep relationships with their participants, which increase the authenticity of the findings they get. Thus, researchers and participants are collaborators who have shared power in determining how the research should go, what perspectives to pursue, and what solutions to offer. Finally, outsiders to the research also contribute to qualitative validity. They follow the audit trail to make sure that researchers are transparent in their documentation and make conclusions that are appropriate to the circumstances, ensure a thick and rich description of research processes to achieve greater detail, truth likeness, and contextualization, and debrief their peers to consider alternative perspectives and recommendations for improving their work. Clearly, qualitative research also abides by comparable standards of rigor and quality, just that we have to look at reliability and validity from a different lens. We use reliability and validity to judge the accuracy of claims made by studies. We've looked at reliability and validity from the quantitative and qualitative traditions and what indices and strategies researchers consider in their studies. How do we use this knowledge to evaluate whether studies are making accurate conclusions? Beth Morning gives us a useful set of standards for assessing the validity of quantitative studies, interrogating three claims with four validities. A claim in research is simply any conclusion or argument a study is trying to make. It can be a frequency claim, a statement about the rate or degree of some variable. This is common in the results of surveys like 74% are satisfied with politician X performance or 9 out of 10 Filipinos prefer band Y. It can be a claim about the association or relationship between two variables, which is reported in correlation or regression analyses. Causation claims also link two variables together, but this time, an independent variable manipulated by the researcher is assumed to cause changes in a measured-dependent variable. This is the setup for experimental studies. Confusion warning. Though researchers are usually careful in phrasing association and causation claims differently, Top psych articles and other sources can end up using similar terms, even if these two claims are different. Findings like night owls may be more creative than early birds, or lack of sleep is linked to early mortality, are usually association claims because they emphasize a non-directional relationship, while organized note-taking improves memory for lessons, or being in a state of anxiety decreases rational problem solving, can be causal claims, noting that one variable is assumed to be the cause of changes in the other. Then we have four validities, all asking roughly the same question. Can we trust this finding, considering the method and evidence given by the study? Construct validity is something we considered earlier. It tells us if our measure on manipulation is really capturing the concept or phenomenon we intended, or if our operationalization is close enough to what is actually happening in the world. This is important to establish, regardless of what claim we're evaluating. Next. Statistical validity is about how well the study's conclusions are supported by the data they have. For frequency claims, we check the margin of error of the estimate. As we will discuss in a later lesson on sampling, we usually don't have the time or resources to include every single person in our study, so we get a smaller group which we call the sample. If we get a sample that is similar in characteristics to the whole group we got them from, we are a bit more confident that whatever this smaller group says, reflects what the larger group would have if we ask everyone. The margin of error reminds us that there's bound to be an influence somewhere which would make our samples' answers different from the whole groups 
and this margin approximates how far off our estimate is from the real answer which would have been given by the whole group. Meanwhile, association and causal claims have a few considerations in common. Findings can be non-significant or have too small an effect size to have any practical consequence on our lives. We can have false positives or type 1 errors, where analyses show that an association or causal effect is present when it's just chance that led to this finding. Or, on the opposite side, we can have false negatives or type 2 errors, concluding that no relationship or effect exists, when in fact we just missed it. Some correlations or causal relationships are stronger, some are weaker, and all of these determine whether we have evidence that is strong and definitive enough for us to conclude that the study is right in making the conclusions that it does. Next, internal validity evaluates whether the change in our measured variable is indeed due to the influence of our manipulated variable and not some other factor. This is unique to experiments and causal claims because we only have one variable in frequency claims and we are careful not to assume causality in correlation studies reporting association claims. That is, when we find an association between two variables, we don't know which causes what or whether an entirely different variable, which we didn't measure, is actually the reason for why we're seeing a relationship at all. However, we're willing to make causal claims in experiments provided we account for three things. First, we look for covariance. When the variable changes, the other does so too. If they don't change systematically with each other, we consider that they're not related. Next, in temporal precedence, the variable we control must come first in time before the one we're measuring. If they happen at the same time, or our controlled variable happens last, when what's causing the changes in what we're measuring? Finally, internal validity, as we've mentioned, is about eliminating any influences we call confounds to make sure that the changes we observe are really caused by the variables we control. Lastly, we ask about external validity, how much a finding can apply to other people outside those participating in the study, and whether the conclusions would hold to in other times, situations, and cultures. External validity is greatly tied to sampling, so we'll talk about it more then. But one thing we have to note is that internal and external validity are somewhat inversely related to each other. The more that a study is internally valid, meaning we bottle up a psychological concept by controlling for more possible confounds, the less externally valid it becomes, because the research setting ends up too artificial and too far removed from everyday life, but people can end up behaving in remarkably different ways inside versus outside the laboratory. We are research producers, so we have to know what to consider when designing our studies. At the same time, as consumers, we also need to be critical whether our sources of information are really making valid claims about interventions, policies, or even trivia about us. Reliability and validity are two of the considerations we should keep in mind when designing and evaluating studies. So, we took a good look at how they are defined in quantitative and qualitative research, as well as the strategies, indices, and standards we consider. Still, Research becomes rigorous not only through the efforts of the psychologists doing them, but also the people involved who share their time and experiences so we can make sense of ourselves and the world. That's why the sample, the group of people directly involved in our studies, can shape what findings we get depending on their characteristics. More importantly, how well that small group represents everyone else can limit when and to whom our findings apply. So, next up on the series is sampling and generalizability. See you then.